Hello Year 11. This lesson we are looking at the North-South divide in the UK and the strategies that have been put in place by the government in order to try to overcome that divide. Now first of all obviously we need to understand what is meant by the North-South divide and don't take this division line here too seriously. Different people have different ideas as to where the North-South divide would be but it's basically a line that divides the north and the south based on sometimes real and sometimes imagined differences. So some of those differences are to do with sort of culture and your accent and the words that you use and maybe what you think is important in life. And other differences are harder and more economic, sort of to do with jobs and money and wages and access to services. In general, with the north-south divide, it's the idea that the standard of living is higher in the South and that living in the South, you have a longer life expectancy and a higher income. However, also with that go some disadvantages such as more expensive house prices, it's more crowded, it's more congested. And according to some pieces of research, the people in the South are actually less happy than the people in the North, even though they are more wealthy. Now we need to have a look to see what kind of definite evidence there is for a north-south divide. So we're going to have a look at a few maps. So this first one is pretty basic and it shows us those levels of disposable income. Remember disposable income is the money that you have left when you have paid for all your essentials. So it's the money that you can spend to treat yourself in a way. And on this scale, the darker the colour, the more disposable income you have available. Um, we can see a definite north-south divide here. Okay, so we've got the sort of the southwest and the southeast. We have the sort of darker colours showing higher levels of disposable income. And then throughout the Midlands and the north, we have a lower level of disposable income. And um, so that definitely shows this idea of a north-south a north -south divide. Picks up again a bit in Scotland, okay, but we can see there that this data, yeah, definitely suggesting there is a north-south divide there. So this map is showing us deprivation across the UK. And remember, deprivation is when you don't have something. So if you are here, the most deprived, it is likely that you don't have access to good housing. You don't have access to good education. You maybe can't afford to buy nutritious food. So these are the people with the money, the least deprived. And these are the people without much money, the most deprived. So if we look at the map, we can see that we do have a mix, but definitely in this area of the southeast, we've got more yellow, which are the least deprived. And as we move through some northern areas, so Birmingham, Sheffield, Leeds, we can definitely see areas of blue here in the northeast, near to Newcastle, Hull, we can see areas of blue. So don't forget the blue is showing deprived areas, poor areas. But then if we look at London, there is certainly large areas of blue. So we can definitely say that there is deprivation in the south, but it's pretty concentrated in the London area, although we do have wealthy areas within London as well. Something to point out, though, is these areas that have got these red dots. These show the 10 most deprived areas in the UK, so the poorest areas. And we can see that eight out of 10 of them are in the northwest. We've got one over here in the east. And the most deprived is this place here, Jaywick Sands. It was in the news not so long ago. So if you popped that into Google, you'd be able to have a look at some newspaper articles about it. Now, depending on wh whether you lived in the south or in the north, you would probably have different opinions on whether or not you would think that was somewhere that was um, either south or north of the north-south divide. But certainly we can say that nine out of 10 of the most deprived areas of the UK are in the north, okay? Right, let's have a look at a, another piece of data. And we have got healthcare across the UK. Now this certainly shows a more mixed pattern. The dark colours show areas where children are not achieving a good level of development and that is seen as a good representation of healthcare. So the dark colours are bad and the paler colours are good. Okay, so we have definitely got a real mix. We've got a big mix in London. We can see there we've got all the colours of the spectrum. 
but I think it is true to say we do have some darker coloured areas in the north, maybe more so, okay, because we've got these areas here in the northwest and the northeast. We've got sort of like, you know, the, um, the north here, so sort of Yorkshire region, Leeds here, we've, but we've definitely got some areas in the south as well. So healthcare is showing a bit of a mixed point of view. Um, if we look at education, that again is showing quite a clear pattern for the idea of a north-south divide because these paler colours show better levels of education, okay, here. And these bluey colours show the worst levels of education. Unfortunately for us, Yorkshire and Humberside, we have got the worst level. I mean, I'm sure we're going to change that with you guys because you're going to do so fantastically well in your exams. But this education data certainly reflects the idea of a north-south divide. Now, we need to try and understand why this has happened um, if we're going to try and solve it. And really, it all comes down to jobs, because if you don't have a job, you don't have much money. And if you don't have much money, you're going to be deprived because you can't afford um, to buy things for yourself. So this comes from that change in industry that we've been looking at for the last few lessons and the idea that the North depended on that heavy industry from the Industrial Revolution. So the coal fields, the steelworks. And when those closed down um, in the reign of Margaret Thatcher, when she was our prime minister, nothing was really put in place to replace those industries. So you ended up with that cycle of decline that we've talked about where if the main employer of an area doesn't exist anymore, that has a knock-on effect to everybody else who lives in that area. Because if you lose your job, um, you don't have any money, you're not going to be going out to the local pub, you're not going to be buying new fancy clothes, you're not going to be going and getting your hair done. So everybody else in that community suffers as well. Um, whereas whilst we've had that decline in the north, in London and the south east, it's grown really rapidly as a global financial centre. They've had media there, they've had the arts there. So that's led to economic growth in the southeast because of that increase in the finance and the media market, while the north has declined because of the decrease in industry. So what's been done to try to um, solve this problem? Well, one of the things that's been looked at is this idea of a northern powerhouse. Now, the northern powerhouse is a little bit difficult to understand. It's not really a, a one definite thing. It's a concept or it's an idea. And it's the idea of trying to um, give business benefits and reasons to move to the north. If you watch this little video, it'll give you an idea of what the northern powerhouse is. And I'll put that link into the assignment. Um, one of the main ways to do this is by improving transport. And we've looked in our lessons at improvements in transport, things like Liverpool too. Um, there's a lot of rural space, so rural areas in the north as well. So as well as developing the cities like Liverpool and Manchester, um, Manchester especially because the BBC have moved their offices to Manchester recently. And that, again, is part of the idea of the northern powerhouse. But also for the rural areas, they're looking at expanding tourism, food, particularly energy. The UK is going to be making massive investments in wind power. And in the north, where you've got space and hills and wind, perfect place for those wind turbines. Another thing that we've looked at um, very briefly is HS2, okay, so high speed two. So this idea of a high speed railway linking London with Birmingham in phase one and then further north again in phase two. Um, now, HS2 was thought of years ago and it's been ongoing. It's very, very controversial. People have fought against its development in the courts. There have been numerous government reviews. But finally, this year, they have started on the preparation work for the first part of it, phase one, from London to Birmingham. Um, and the idea is that if you can get quicker from London to Birmingham, it will encourage more businesses to locate in the north. So we are just going to look now at the different pros and cons of HS2 and why it is so controversial. So you might have seen this picture here doing the rounds on social media and it's a tree, big tree, that's been cut down and obviously a local person or a protester, somebody like that, who's clearly really distressed about this. This is the Cubbington pear, or rather was the Cubbington pear, because it has been felled, it's been cut down. And the reason it has been cut down 
is because of HS2. So you can see on this map, this line shows you where HS2 will go. And here is Cubbington, where the Cubbington pair was. And this little map is just showing you where it is in the UK. Now, because the trains go so quickly, the HS2 line has to be reasonably straight. So anything that's in its way is getting chopped down. Uh, any houses or villages in its way are getting demolished. And that is why it is so controversial, because to a lot of people, the um, the consequences of HS2 and the loss of countryside and the loss of people's homes is just too great. Okay, Nothing is worth that to some people. And the Cubbington pear has become a symbol of that, if you like. It was a 250 year old tree, so one of the oldest trees in Britain. It was very beautiful. It won tree of the year in 2015. I mean, who even knew there was a tree of the year award? But there is. Um, and despite protests and despite people trying to stop it, the Cubbington pear was chopped down. And it wasn't even chopped down for the train line itself, but for a road um, to allow vehicles to get in for the building of the train line. So to a lot of people, it's a real symbol of everything that is wrong with HS2 because this beautiful old tree has been chopped down in order to make way for a train line. Now, there are certainly lots of people that are in favour of HS2. It's going to be fast, it's going to be efficient, it's going to be great. What's not to love about it? But if you watch these two video clips, you will definitely see um, a bit of a different side. And we'll look at those pros and cons more closely in a minute. This video here, the Barnbra one, um, that is a news report. It's well worth watching. Again, I will put that link um, in the assignment for you. And it's just showing people who are losing their houses because of HS2. This video, the Jonathan Pye one, it comes with a little bit of a health warning. So Jonathan Pye is a comedian. He is someone who pretends to be a news reporter and he rants and he swears a lot. OK, so this is a really good video for HS2. It shows the pros and the cons really well but only watch it if you are not going to be offended by swearing. He does swear an awfully large amount. So I will leave it up to you. You're old enough to make that decision for yourself whether or not you want to watch it. OK, let's look at these pros and cons a little bit more closely for HS2. OK, so I have split these pros and cons into economic, social and environmental. I'm not going to talk you through all of them. You know, I'd like you to stop the video and have a read through them. But basically, in a nutshell, with the economic, it is hoped that people will be encouraged, businesses will be encouraged to relocate to the north because that journey time from London, our capital, will be will be quicker and it will make meetings easier. OK, it will free up space on existing train lines. So you know, local businesses can thrive and use the old, because the, the old train lines are still going to be there. So they'll be able to be having more trains running on the old train lines. And obviously you've got jobs of construction. However, going with that, there is the argument that many of those jobs in construction are not British. Um, you know, we're employing a lot of Chinese businesses and companies to do this. Um, and the cost is huge. So it, the, the, I think even people who are in support of HS2 would agree that the cost has begun to spiral out of control. Initially, it was supposed to cost, I think, 32 billion. And the cost has just got higher and higher and higher until it's now thought that it's going to cost maybe 100 billion. OK, for the social um, pros and cons, there'll be hopefully less road traffic. So there'll be fewer road accidents, fewer deaths. OK. But on the other side of that argument, you've got the fact that people's houses are being knocked down and being destroyed to make way for HS2. I mean, people are going to get compensation, but is that good enough for losing your home? And also the idea that HS2 is only going to benefit a very small amount of people. So it's only going to benefit you if you're making those frequent business trips between London and Birmingham. If you're not, it doesn't matter to you, you know, what, what's the 20 minute faster journey if you're not doing that journey regularly? And then possibly some of the biggest concerns are environmental. So, of course, there's the argument that maybe people will be encouraged to catch a train rather than catch a local short haul flight if they want to get somewhere quickly. Um, and also the idea that more goods can be sent by rail. So you're going to reduce the um, 
flights, you're going to maybe reduce the amount of lorries on the road. On the other hand, however, the construction of HS2 is causing the largest deforestation levels in the UK in over 100 years. And a lot of those areas that are being destroyed are wildlife reserves. So as well as the Cubbington Pear, um, a wildlife reserve called the Calvert Jubilee um, in Buckinghamshire has been destroyed as well. And that has caused a lot of upset. Um, HS2 claim they're trying to move whole ecosystems, but that claim's been kind of dismissed as rubbish by a lot of ecologists who just say, you know, you can't move an ecosystem. They are far too complex. So take a bit of time, read this through, and I'll also put a copy of this in the file um, for class materials so you can look at it at your leisure. So we can kind of break down the pros and cons of HS2 into different categories. On the pros, we have got evidence that it will increase levels of education and skill. A lot of colleges are offering apprenticeships in engineering based on the idea that people can then go and work on HS2. We have got job production, mostly whilst it's being built, but also afterwards as well. You know, there's going to be people having jobs for the, in the long term because of HS2. So train drivers or controllers, things like that. And then environmental improvements, if these ideas of reduced air flight for short haul and reduced traffic on the roads actually happen. On the cons, however, we have got the idea that the money is being misspent. So one of the biggest criticisms is that for that 100 billion, you could just improve the transport networks in the north. You know, you don't have to build a new train line. We've already got train lines. It's just that they need money spending on them. There is the idea, the argument that it's just going to increase London's wealth because you're making it quicker and easier to get to London. So therefore, more businesses will just locate in London because you're making it easier and faster to get there. So it's like it will work the opposite way around. Um, there's the idea of money being lost um, because, you know, um, money going to foreign companies rather than British companies. And then finally, we've got environmental destruction. So you've got different pros and different cons. So to give you an idea of the kind of questions that you might meet on an exam because of this, you might get a nice easy one, a nice four marker that would be like, you know, explain how improving transport links can help reduce the north-south divide. And then you would talk about HS2 and you could um, just write about the benefits of it. You know, the shorter journey times, businesses locating in northern cities and you could also write a thing about things like Liverpool too okay and that the dock up in Liverpool too bringing more business into the north but different things you could write about there there's also these ones which are a bit more complicated could be six markers or nine markers so you could have a question that asks you to assess the effectiveness of strategies um, being used to reduce the north south divide so this is a difficult question because nowhere in this question does it mention transport or train lines. However, HS2 and Liverpool 2 are both strategies being used to reduce the north-south divide. So this would be a tough question to get in the exam and you would have to make that link of what the north-south divide is, the idea that the south is more wealthy than the north and what is being done to try to reduce that. Well, to try to reduce that north-south divide, we are improving transport. How are we improving transport? Well, we've got HS2 and we've got the docks of Liverpool too. Okay, so that might be like, say, a six marker, might even be a nine marker. Something like this is more likely to be a nine marker. So improvements in transport infrastructure will only bring improvements to the UK. To what extent do you agree with this statement? So that would really, um, once you had remembered to write about HS2, that would really be a good one where you would just be writing quite simply about the pros and cons of HS2 and what benefits it brings and what problems it brings. OK, so that is a lot to get through, um, especially if you watch the little videos I've suggested you watch. So, 
you know this might well take you more than an hour so I am really really sorry about that and do try and do the assignment I will try and keep that assignment short for you so you're not doing stacks of writing because I know you've done stacks of listening um, but hopefully this has been clear if you do have any questions please email me at school okay I'll see you later bye